Hello and welcome to episode five of the Breastfeeding Podcast Series. In this breastfeeding series so far, we have covered the five things to help you establish a successful breastfeeding relationship, the magical breast crawl and how to help initiate this after birth, the power of antenatal expressing and why storing colostrum can be a super immunity booster for your baby, how to manage mastitis, nipple damage and milk supply issues after birth and so much more. We have covered a lot. (laughs) Like with any pregnancy, birth or motherhood related topic, every person and their dog will tell you stories about breastfeeding. Now, not all of them, and in fact, a lot of them will simply not be true. It may be that person's individual experience or it may be an old wives tale. Either way, Amberly busts through all of these myths today with evidence-based research so that you know fact from fiction. In today's episode, we cover whether you should prepare your nipples with a nail file or sandpaper or not, (laughs) whether formula will help your baby sleep through the night, the truth about breastfeeding after six months, whether lentils will make your child gassy, whether boob size indicates supply and so much more. Enjoy. I am very excited for this segment because I know that this is what women have been wanting to hear. So we are going to do a myth busting segment. So I have asked my pregnancy posse members and my social media audience to send in the most common myths they've been told about breastfeeding specifically. There's a million other myths they've been told about pregnancy and motherhood and all of that, but specifically for breastfeeding. And I was absolutely bamboozled (laughs) when I saw these come in and it was from mothers, mother-in-laws, sisters, friends, midwives, GPs. Like it was from a whole range of different people. There was no one culprit who was spreading these <laughs> myths. <laughs> and I just think this is going to be so good because women, I think, feel quite embarrassed to share some of these myths with me. And they, they openly said that. Yeah. And, and so I worry that women then, if they're not um, confident enough to speak out and say, is this actually true? That they're going to carry those beliefs with them into birth and into breastfeeding their baby. And it's just a whole world of misinformation. And so I want to bust through all these myths. Now, I have prepared some of them for you, but some of these are going to be new for you. So um, this will really get you thinking (laughs) on your toes. (laughs) So let's get into it because there's quite a number. So first of all, Do you need to prepare your nipples before birth? So a number of women told me that they were encouraged to use a nail file to brush. Oh, I know. It makes me shiver. To brush up against their nipples or to get a baby toothbrush and scrub them every time they go to the shower. (laughs) I wish everyone who's listening to this through their earphones, if you can see Amberly's face right now. (laughs) So, Amberly, what is the answer to that myth? (laughs) No, you do not have to do that. No, definitely don't do that. Everyone's adjustment process is different because it depends on our skin type. I think that's what's really important is that, you know, some mothers experience bad nipple damage and plenty don't. And and so um, it depends on, yeah, that collagen and the elastin, the amount of melatonin in our skin as well. Um, And, um, you know, like that, yeah, my gosh, that's melanin. As I said that, I'm like, it's not melatonin, melanin. That's a sleep Um, Exactly, yeah. I was like, you know, you say something and you're like, I, yeah. don't, I don't know what it, it's it's wrong, but I don't know what the new the other one is. <laughs> exactly. So um, typically, and this has not been studied, but mothers who um, experience sunburn, I find, are more likely to have some nipple damage. And then mothers who don't get don't burn in the sun, who go brown um, or have got darker skin, they tend to not have major issues with nipple damage. Um, and it's yeah, definitely not been studied, but it it does tell the story of maybe yeah, like you know, that's what's happening with that melanin. Is that it's really helping um, that adjustment for, for breastfeeding. So because you might be a mother that not, doesn't get any nipple damage and also remember that process of adjustment happens when our babies are breastfeeding. So you might do this work with the nail file. Oh my gosh. Um, oh, and no. it's not going to help you. Like it might, you, it, yeah. yeah. So no, please don't worry about doing don't waste any your of that. Time. Yeah, no. Okay. And I'm just thinking while we're talking about that, um, should your nipples essentially be tougher second, third, fourth time round or not necessarily? Your nipples change when you breastfeed. You, you, you probably remember yourself. If you remember what your, what your nipples were like before you had babies and then after you've breastfed just your first baby, they definitely change. Um, they they lengthen. sit lower towards the ground. <laughs> <laughs> There's that. 
but they lengthen in a very they totally change in shape um which is great because that's why they're so amazing and adaptable um so but it still means that when you have your second baby your your nipples need to adjust again um so it's not that you don't get nipple damage with subsequent babies um but i do think breastfeeding does come easier for because mm. your breasts have done it before so your mm. you know your yeah that collagen and those elastin fibers are not really being ignited like with your first baby um that yeah our babies can like basically have our nipple in their mouth and they can turn their head and kind of take our nipple with them um that's the worst <laughs> when they're old enough to do that yes it is the worst yes um but you know that yeah that can happen with subsequent babies it's not as big a deal than probably when it happened with our first baby we're like oh, i didn't even yes. know my nipples could stretch that far like that's crazy <laughs> Okay, good myth busting. Thank you. Okay, next one. Does topping your baby up with formula help them sleep through the night? This is a really good question because a lot of people do get told to do this, do a bottle of formula at night. So let's talk about that. So the gastric emptying time with breast milk versus formula is very different. So with, with breast milk, it's about 90 minutes it takes from, for our baby to break, break down breast milk. And that's from the start of the feed because remember, as soon as your milk hits your baby's tummy, they're breaking it down in their gut. So if you sit there for, I don't know, an hour, do a breastfeed for an hour, it means that you've probably only got half an hour of downtime before your baby, rightly so, will feel hungry. They will have really broken down your milk. With formula, if it's based off a cow's milk formula, the gastric emptying time is three times longer than that. It's about four and a half hours it takes for them to break down uh, one dose of formula. So during that time, yes, a baby is going to sleep in a very different way. They're going to go into quite a different sleep cycle. Um, but I think what's important to sort of explain with that as well is um, – there is sadly there's higher rates of SIDS with formula fed babies compared to breastfed babies um, and we don't know why but this is a theory and it's to do with the gastric emptying time. So SIDS is linked with a reduction in oxygen and so when the breastfed baby feels the, that hunger in their tummy um, they come out of their sleep cycle they cry and they take in big breaths of oxygen and they they rouse whereas with formula the um, the worry is that maybe what's happening for these babies is they're going into that deeper sleep cycle they're still feeling hung like the, the milk in their tummy so they're not feeling that hunger um, and then they don't rouse and so um, I guess I'm saying that because sometimes mothers do get that promise of more sleep with formula and they think fantastic this is really going to be great because yes we're all so sleep deprived as new mothers um, but frequent night wakings is actually part of the the survival of our species it's actually a very important measure um, mm -hmm. and just seeking extra sleep um, isn't is, isn't everything that it's about um, and just something that you can know as a breastfeeding mom is that you're actually helping protect your baby against SIDS in some mm -hmm. some really major ways mm, that's great and they will eventually sleep. <laughs> yes, they will. Exactly. Yep. And, Thank you know, you. I think the thing with formula too is that like formula, there's such a place for formula for mothers that have got a low supply and they maybe milk sharing isn't the right fit. They don't have access to a milk bank. There's, we're so lucky formula exists and there's definitely a place for it. I wouldn't say helping your baby sleep for longer is the place. Um, yes. um, and so if that's what you are seeking, I would be like, okay, well, I think maybe let's more talk about normalizing night wakings and why yes. there's, yeah, there's, they're playing a role um, as opposed to sort of, yeah, using it as a way to get more sleep. Yes, I think that's I think that's very important. I think realistic expectations. I, I interviewed um, a sleep consultant and we were chatting about setting women up to succeed by not telling them that your baby should sleep through the night yeah, at 10 weeks old. So I remember good. a girlfriend telling me that her baby slept through from 10 weeks and my son slept through from one year. And I remember every week after 10 weeks going, oh, it must be this week. It must be this week. Yeah. When's he going to sleep yeah. through? And it really, um, mm -hmm. it really wasn't realistic. Mm -hmm. So I think, yes, uh, being more realistic about night wakings is, is the first step. Yeah. So thank you. Now, next one. If you don't introduce a bottle straight away, your child will never take one. 
Okay, so I recommend mothers introduce a bottle from six weeks onwards because we really want your baby to learn how to breastfeed. Breastfeeding and bottle feeding are very different um, skills for a baby. It's a very different suck reflex involved. So um, once your baby's had six weeks to establish breastfeeding, that's a really great time to introduce a bottle. Uh, if you want to, you don't have to introduce a bottle. Um, but say, you know, you've got plans to return to work and you know your baby's going to need to use a bottle. That's the time I would say to start practicing the bottle with them. Um, and you can definitely practice the bottle. Now, breastfed babies, are, they're all very different. I find some of them, they start on the bottle and they're fantastic and they do it for a long time. And then they just reach this age where they just refuse the bottle. They will have nothing to do with it. They just want their mum. And then there's babies that don't do so well learning how to use a bottle. They're a bit all over the place, but then they just kind of get the hang of it and they're great. Um, mm. So there's not sort of no guaranteed, like, I don't have this special formula that's like, you know, Damn. you do. <laughs> you do the bottle on this day and then you do it every second day or, you know, there's nothing like that because I've really learned that every baby is very individual um, yes. as to how they go with the bottle and if they want to like keep going with it or whether they're like, and, and look, rightly so, breastfed babies love breastfeeding. They're, yes. they, it's, it's not, as we talked about, it's not just about food. It's not a source of food. Um, and so quite often their preference is, well, I would rather, maybe I'll have a, the bare minimum out of the bottle and then I'm just going to mm. hang out until my mom gets home because yes. I don't want to drink out of that weird plastic thing. Um, yeah. And yeah, that's very normal as well. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That is very helpful. Now, the next myth, you must burp your baby after every feed. Okay. So breastfed babies don't tend to take in nearly as much wind as say a bottle fed baby. And so you're not necessarily having to burp them. It's not about you must burp, but it's about giving them some upright time. So maybe after the feed, um, I know not everyone can see me, but um, you would put your baby on your lap and just use um, your wrist to sort of sit under their chin and just lean them forward and give them that upright time. Or maybe you'd prefer mm. to go over your shoulder. Um, it's about basically making sure that you you're creating space for them to be upright to help the milk settle in their digestion. They may not burp and that's okay. It's not like you have to sit there and only do this until the burp happens because you might mm. not have a baby that burps easily. Um, mm. But it's just about um, giving them space to be upright. But then there's also plenty of breastfed babies that don't need to be kept upright. Um, mothers can feed side lying, for example, um, and their baby's fine to just finish the feed and stay in that position. So, mm. um, But that would be further down the track when breastfeeding's further established. Awesome. And we did touch on this earlier, but for anyone who maybe didn't listen to that episode, let's go over it again. You will struggle with breastfeeding if you've had a cesarean section. Mm -hmm. So not necessarily um, at all. It's just that you may really benefit from spending some more time skin to skin with your baby. Um, I would say that I say this to all mothers to create time, like really every day feed to put your baby in just a nappy and you be bare from the waist up and let them do the breast crawl to do a feed. Um, and so that's really important for mothers who've had a cesarean, um, is that you're just giving your baby so much opportunity to become really familiar with, with breastfeeding and, and the process that's involved. Um, but there's nothing else more specific. I think the, the only other um, things is just that you've got good pain relief on board so that you can get yourself into like an upright position. You can get out of bed. Um, you can feel like you can sit because um, for certain positions like the cross cradle hold, you need to be very upright. And so mm. if you've got a sore tummy, that's why breastfeeding can also be hard for mums who've had cesareans. I remember when I had a cesarean with my first baby, you're, you're a bit more limited because you 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 want to guard your tummy. So um, mm. sometimes it's it's creating the time that okay I'm going to anticipate this feed, so I'm going to have some pain relief a little bit before. Obviously, all the pain relief is all safe with breastfeeding, um, and you're going to feel like you can then therefore sit up and you know maneuver your baby and and get your baby on properly. Yeah, great. So I think what you, the summary of that is it may be trickier, but there are lots of strategies you can utilize to make yes. sure that you overcome that and from my personal experience I've had two c-sections and I've been breastfeeding collectively for like I don't know almost 18 two months two years <laughs> like and my my milk came in on day three on the dot yeah. no problems yeah. and obviously that's individual but you know 
I, no, there but are... it's still good to tell these stories. These need to be heard because it's, yeah, you're yes. right. It's a really common theme that like I'm going to, I'm, I know I'm going to need a cesarean or, you know, I went in not planning one. I had a cesarean and, oh, my gosh, how is this going to affect my breastfeeding? Yes. And it's like yes. it's all good. These are all things we can work with. Yes, exactly right. Exactly right. Okay, next myth. If you're, oh, I like this one actually. If your mother struggled with breastfeeding, you will likely struggle too. Yeah, that's such a good one. Um, this happens often in birth. Mothers um, think, I, you know, I know my mother had all cesareans and so it means I'm going to have cesareans. Um, and while there might be some parts of that anatomically, there might be some similarities, it doesn't necessarily say that you are going to follow that lineage. You can create your own story um, and that's very important. But the biggest message I would say with that is if your mum, for example, formula fed, um, is your mum supportive of your wishes to breastfeed? Um, it's not necessarily that's what happened for your mum, but support in our social circle and in our family is a big deal with breastfeeding. So you want to have people around you that believe in you and that are saying to you, you know, instead of saying, oh, is your baby feeding again? Like, you know, mm. is, is knowing that babies feed very frequently in the early days. So I think that's what's important is that it doesn't have, we don't have to follow the same path, um, mm. but it can also be helpful that people really yeah want to want to support us with our hope to do something which maybe might as might not be the same way that they did it um but yes. we feel like they respect that we are really we're doing this this is what we want to do yes and you're a different person exactly right I actually remember the hospital I birthed at had separate brochures for grandparents because they acknowledged that how they birthed and parented their babies yeah. was very different to what we know these days. And so it was like a little refresher or an update for grandparents to... Um, so good. Yeah, because for the SIDS guidelines, I know there was a lot of old... Yes wives tales that they might have used that now we know yes. better yes um so yeah I think that something like that is really powerful as well if you're timid to have that conversation to mm. be able to give them a brochure or something yeah. but I, ultimately I think yeah it's your life and you need to be able to have the support around you so that's a great one thank mm. you mm. now this one <laughs> I'm going to give you the backstory to it. So um, the myth is that breast milk is basically water after six months and has no nutritional mm. value. Yeah. So my understanding from this lady's um, message was that her mother had told her that there was no point breastfeeding because there was no nutrition left after six months. So can you please bust that one for me? <laughs> <laughs> Gladly. That's a really common one, actually. That, is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. There's a lot. There's, a lot, of, there's a lot of GPs that tell mothers that from a certain... At a very young age, your breasts, you know, you know, there's a lot of like script or a lot of dialogue that I'm hearing is, you know, you don't need to keep breastfeeding now. You know, you can just give solids and you can just stop. There's a lot of that going on. Oh, um, wow. So, yeah, okay. I know it's um, it's crazy. So what I'll always go back to, I am a huge advocate for the World Health Organization guidelines for breastfeeding um, and what their guidelines are. And I actually have a 662 movement which follows the framework of the guidelines in some ways. So my first um, six in my 662 movement is um, my hope is to play a role in supporting mothers, um, you know, whether that's in person or from afar to be able to breastfeed over the first six weeks um, because statistically if you get to the first six weeks you can go on and follow the world health organization guidelines which is exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months and continued breastfeeding which is you know solids and breastfeeding until the child turns two or beyond so that's my 662 movement um, and so basically mm. those guidelines are based around the fact that they've obviously studied it there's great evidence to indicate that Breast milk plays a very important role in a child's life for the first six months, um, but it continues to play a really major part nutritionally, from an immune perspective, emotionally, socially, um, you know, maternal, there's great maternal benefits. These are the, all the reasons why breast milk is still really important for children um, and for babies um, and toddlers. And it's not that it loses benefit. Um, I think what's more probably what's happening here with some of these stories is that it's when breastfeeding is culturally acceptable and that there's yes. certainly in Australia, there's a real focus on from 12 months onwards breastfeeding is not appropriate if a mm. if a toddler can ask for it if they've got teeth um, there's a lot of reasons why people are not so comfortable with breastfeeding beyond that but I think when we unpack what's happening we can learn that it is a, it is a cultural thing it's not actually about the evidence and the role yes. that breast milk plays in a child's life 
So in summary, breast milk is more than water <laughs> after six months. Oh my gosh, it's so much more than water. You know, breast milk is your baby's primary source of nutrition, um, definitely in the first six months, but really in the first 12 months, because even when we introduce solids around six months, you know, the, the amount of calories that pureed foods or even if you're doing baby led weaning like a stick of broccoli um that's that's got nothing on a breastfeed so um you know for the first 12 months breastfeeding you know breast milk is queen and then after 12 months things shift gears we we notice our babies increase their appetite for solids but breast milk still plays a very important role because toddlers are fussy they don't eat the foods that we would love them to um but also from an immune perspective, breast milk in the second year of life is even more important in a lot of ways because toddlers are mobile. So they get in contact mm-hmm. with a lot of germs and, you know, you know, your colds and your ear infections, your gastro, all of that goes up in the second year of life. And breast milk plays a role that either children, toddlers don't get sick or they get a much milder version. So, you know, that's all what the World Health Organization has studied and why um, I'm yeah a huge um, yeah promoter of those guidelines and why I love um, helping mothers achieve their six six two goals. And it's is it true that like, let's say your child gets a you know, a common cold, your breast milk will adapt specifically to provide the antibodies that your child needs for that specific cold or whatever it is that they're. Yeah. Um, sick with is that true yeah it's totally true yeah there's this amazing exchange that happens between your baby's saliva um, when they breastfeed and your breast milk they communicate with each other so because um, your baby's saliva travels up your milk ducts it's basically meaning that your breast milk creates antibodies specific to that pathogen in your baby system or even in the environment maybe they haven't got sick but they've come into contact with something and so meanwhile um, yeah your your little one's body is saying there's this antigen that I need to work on uh, it's so cool and the other reason I love that is is if you've got more than one little one at home um, that you're going to really protect say your you know your eldest brings home um, a, a bug um, and you're breastfeeding your younger baby um, you're going to yeah basically play a role in meaning that they either don't get sick or they get a much milder version that's amazing mm. again mind blown <laughs> yeah Okay, what else have we got here? So feeding, another myth, feeding your baby to sleep will cause tooth decay. Oh, that's such a good one. Yeah, okay. (laughs) So um, this is definitely talked about a lot. um, And no, the the short answer is no, it doesn't do that. Um, Breastfeeding, when you're actually feeding, the milk itself bypasses your teeth. If a baby's actually attached to the breast properly, um, the milk shouldn't be pooling in your baby's mouth. Um, it should be, they should be drinking it. Um, but that they've definitely done studies on that and found that breast milk does not do that. Um, we are, as a species, we are perfectly adapt at breastfeeding um, and it, it's not um, going to do anything negatively to your teeth. Perfect. <laughs> Another one that was really common, actually, I saw this multiple times, was that after six months, your baby doesn't actually need any feeds overnight. Okay, so that would be probably more speaking to the idea of, yeah, do they need it for hunger? Um, I think what's good is to go back to what we were talking about before about the role that breastfeeding plays in a child's life, that they wake for reasons beyond hunger um, mm. and that night parenting is and night mothering is still something that's, that's really important, still exists. So, um, you know, I, I'm not necessarily here to say yeah, all you have to feed to, back to sleep. Um, I, I understand that every mother needs to do something that works for them. Maybe if your little one's waking frequently in the night, because there are some babies that, that um, you know, wake every 40 minutes. So I remember my gorgeous sister was like delirious with her first baby because he was one of those little ones. Um, yeah. And so, you know, my sister was like, he can't be hungry. Um, so, you know, they're not necessarily hungry, but they do need comfort at night um and yes. so I'm not gonna sort of say as a standard like you need to feed them back to sleep or you you don't feed them back to sleep um that's more um a complex sort of more complex part of how you're mothering um mm. but I would definitely say that because breastfeeding is is about closeness and connection there is still space for night feeds it's not always about hunger yes okay done now this one sounds very appealing to me but I, I feel like it might be false <laughs> That drinking a glass of wine before feeding helps with your letdown. <laughs> How 
helps with your letdown. I don't know that's been studied. I haven't heard that. I think what it probably gets at is that um, you do need to be relaxed to have your letdown reflex. Your letdown reflex is sort of linked with the same way um, that the hormones um, interact when we orgasm. So if we don't feel calm and relaxed, we're not going to orgasm and we're certainly not going to let our milk down into within our milk ducts. Um, mm. So I'm wondering whether that theory is ra- wrapped up in that, that if you've, That's what I you've had a glass of wine, <laughs> you're going to feel nice and calm. Um, yes. But all I'll reference with that is there's a great app called Feed Safe that the Australian yes. Breastfeeding association have created and if you do want to have a glass of wine i would recommend using the app um, so that it can help you work out when is the safe time that you could breastfeed after your wine yes good very good now this lady has um been given this advice from her mother-in-law and she's been told that she can't eat any lentils or onions because it will give her baby gas what's your take on that Yeah, so that's a similar thing we're sort of touching on earlier. I just don't, I'm not a recommender of you need to cut out all of, yep, the beans, um, you know, cabbage, cauliflower, spices, garlic, caffeine. Like there's so many things that mothers are told, oh, you've got to cut all of that out of your diet. Um, And it's like, well, is there a problem? Like my philosophy is more, is your baby having major issues with wind? And it's often not just wind because breastfed babies do have to get used to their digestion working. So they have challenges with wind. Imagine what it's like for a baby. They've come in utero, come from in utero where they've never felt what it feels like to be hungry or to be overfed, like to have all this Mm. milk in their tummy. Like there's babies get unsettled because there's a lot going on in their body that they don't know what's going on. Imagine how that would feel. And so, um, you know, my whole thing is it, it lets, is it normal what kind of wind your baby's experiencing? Um, and if it's not, then usually it's in the presence of other things. Is there mucus in your baby's stool? Is there blood in their stool? Have they got a rash? Um, have they got cradle cap? Are there other reasons why we need to go down the path of what's called an elimination diet? Do do we need to cut out all these foods or is that total overkill because the wind that your baby's experiencing is actually just really normal for their digestion adjusting? So I'm not a everyone, every breastfeeding mother needs to cut out certain foods because I think that's just overkill. Um, Mm. And uh, yeah, I, I am more, let's just unpack what's happening with each baby and go from there. So get that lentil soup on the stove (laughs) and see how it goes. And the funny thing is quite often if mothers have had these foods in pregnancy, remember in pregnancy you've had that same, yeah, Mm, like, you know, your amniotic fluid was laced with the flavours of the foods that you're eating. So even though it's a much stronger experience in breastfeeding, it is. Like our breast milk is laced with the flavours of the foods that we eat. Um, But like I would often just say to mothers, did you have the lentil soup in your pregnancy? Because if you did, your baby is probably going to be totally fine. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Because I always joke that my son was going to have a real liking to hash browns and oranges because they were my <laughs> cravings in my first pregnancy. He'll either like them or he might hate them. He might be like, yeah. not these again. Oh, God. <laughs> and Vegemite and cheese toasties in my second. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, funny. Now, the next myth, we just have a couple left, Good. is that breastfeeding will make you lose weight faster. No, that's not not true for everyone. Like, again, everyone's experience is different. We do need to eat extra calories. There are some mothers that lose weight really easily. Um, and there's other mothers that they do the opposite. They just hold on to weight in pregnancy mm. in breastfeeding. Um, and it's not until after maybe that they feel like they can have more of an impact in shifting it. Um, it's very individual. Yeah. Yes. I love that. Um this one is interesting and we, we, we sort of touched on before, but I know a lot of women um, feel worried about this, that large breasts will produce more milk and small breasts will produce a small amount of milk. Mm. No, definitely not accurate either. Depends. It's not about this. what's on the outside. Uh, it's on what's on the inside that counts. <laughs> it, I know there's so many benefits to that, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, it's your milk ducts. So, you know, I have very small boobs and, you know, I've had an abundant milk supply with two babies. So, yeah, no, yeah, it's definitely not like that. Um, and then there's mothers that have, yeah, really, really large breasts and they don't necessarily have heaps of milk. So, um, yes. no, it's not, not that simple. 
That's good because I know even a number of friends who have um, small breasts who, yeah, just assume that they'll struggle with breastfeeding. So I think that's a really good one to bust. Now, the last one, and you'll actually be able to attest to this personally because you did tandem feed, was that uh, when you fall pregnant, your breast milk will dry up and your baby will wean. Yeah. Okay. So your, your supply changes. Yes. So, um, yeah, so you're breastfeeding a toddler, you get pregnant around the fifth or sixth month of your pregnancy, you will stop making mature milk that your toddler's drinking and you will start making colostrum and that's in readiness for the baby in utero. But the difference is that mothers, um, who are breastfeeding, um, when they get pregnant, they tend to have this abundant amount of colostrum. So your toddler can get fussy. There's usually about a week where they, are frustrated because you're not making the same amount of milk and you might even have um, not yet yeah, very little available for them. Um, but generally, if they really enjoy breastfeeding, they'll still keep feeding. Um, and then you'll, you'll hear them start to swallow a lot more and then you'll be like, ah, my colostrum's here. Um, and then they drink colostrum for the rest of the pregnancy. And then, yeah, same thing happens. You Then you have your new baby um, and your new baby is the one that sort of sends the messages to bring in your milk. Um, and you can definitely make the same, like the right amount of milk for your new baby and your toddler. Um, it all works very well. It's, uh, it's amazing. Yeah. I've always wondered that with tandem feeding. So the baby drives the yeah. lactation supply and the toddler sort of just gets the, not the hand-me-down milk, but like they're not in charge so much as the baby is. Yeah, it's more what's happening because it's the pre- your pregnancy, basically. Yes. It's like that experience of your baby being in utero. It's the placenta that's sending the signals to say to make the colostrum and then it's the birth of the placenta that then and then your, your newborn baby's feeding and so then they mm. learn to sort of change, shift from colostrum to transition milk to mature milk. So it all just kind of works. But what's really important if mothers do want to do this, I always say, breastfeed your newborn first you need to Mm. prioritize they're the ones that need to grow the most um Mm -hmm. and then you teach your toddler you will have your turn um but you Mm -hmm. need to you can have milk soon and then they just learn that i think it's a beautiful way to carve out space in the world for someone else as well it helps Mm. toddlers really understand sharing in a different way to like sharing your toy with your baby Mm. that you're not going to be doing it's like Mm. okay i'm sharing this close time as well um Mm. yeah and it just it's amazing and i honestly like i think I know I don't know that many people that did it but um mm. for anyone that I know who's like my son ended up having two lots of colostrum um and his immunity is phenomenal like he's just uh, he rocks my world and so for my few girlfriends that I know that have tanned and fed we are all on the same page with this with our eldest who was the one that ended up getting two rounds of colostrum I feel yeah. like those kids have just got superpowers it's just amazing right. yeah. <laughs> so good yeah. oh, I find that so fascinating I um my son weaned when I was about three months pregnant yeah, it and happens. I still yeah and I wondered if it was just his age or whether it tasted different mm-hmm. but um I still remember and you probably get this story a lot but I thought that you know our last feed would be dictated by me and we'd have a salt lamp on and some beautiful music and I would say darling this is your last feed you know no more after this Mm, mm. (laughs) and instead what actually happened in reality (laughs) was that he he latched on he maybe had like two little sucks of milk he might have bit me I can't remember if he bit me (laughs) And then, yeah, no, he did. That's right. He bit me. He looked up at me. He laughed and then he rolled off and went into play with his toys. And that was our last feed we ever had. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, hang on. I was meant to be the one that chose that. I was, like, I was like, look, good that there wasn't, you know, a fight about it yes. and he wasn't upset. But I was like, that's not how it was meant to end. Yeah. And I wonder whether it was the fact that you would had your, yes, your milk would have changed in taste. So that's why a lot of toddlers mm. do self-wean in pregnancy. Um, or yeah, was it your supply was maybe starting to shift already at three months? Um, yeah. and so he was like, oh yeah, I'm okay. Like this is, this is, I'm done. Oh so, yeah. yes. I'm finished. But I, do you know, I love, I think when uh, we can follow our baby's lead or our toddler's lead, I think there's so much about that. That's really wonderful. Yes. So yeah. I think you did an incredible job. Yeah. Well yeah. done. <laughs> <laughs> I was so, I didn't think I'd be so sad, but I was like, no, I hey, mister. Yeah. Like, and I thought he was going to be really hard work to we. <laughs> I just had this story in my mind that oh, he likes it so much. Yeah. It's going to be such hard work. And then he laughed in my face and rolled away. I was like, come on. 
<laughs> Anyhow, I can't complain. It was probably the easiest yes, way to transition. Yes, it was probably a pretty nice way to do it. Yes. Mm. Uh, thank you so much. That myth busting is going to be so helpful to so many women because it's Good. crazy and yeah. like bamboozling as so many of those sounded. They're, they're common mm. and the women are hearing these from lots of different avenues. So it's good that you've set the record straight and helped us to understand that, um, in fact, no, everything I just said is untrue. <laughs> So thank you Don't so much for that. that. Of course. Now, Amberly is going to be doing some amazing video demonstrations for our Posse members. So this is going to be living inside the Pregnancy Posse membership. She is going to be showing us some hand expressing demos on her fake boob mm-hmm. because uh, that is very realistic. <laughs> it is. And she's also going to be demonstrating a correct latch demo so we can all understand exactly where baby's um, mouth and nipple are meant to be aligning. Yeah. We're also going to be talking a little bit about introducing a bottle and how that might look and when the best time to do that is. And we're going to talk about some pumping because I know a lot of Posse members had questions about pumping. So Amberly <laughs> has given up her time to give this great information to all our members. So thank you so much for that, Amberly. Of course. We've had a lot of Pregnancy Posse members ask me about bottles. So a lot of women want their partner to be able to give a bottle so that they can bond with the baby and also so they can have a bit of a break. So they know that they can get some sleep or have some time away and what they're wondering is when is the best time to introduce a bottle um and should it be something that they should be thinking about before they've even had their baby so should they be buying bottles should they be worrying about that or should they just wait and see how everything goes once baby arrives what's your take on that yeah such a good question so with bottles i recommend mothers avoid bottles in the first six weeks if possible and just focus on teaching their baby how to breastfeed because breastfeeding is a very specific um process for a baby this is my um fake boob um so what they do when they open their mouth is they use their tongue to kind of massage the ducts underneath a mother's breast um and they and in that sort of massage action they remove the milk from the ducts so it's this very specific process of that suck swallow reflex Um, it's nothing like what happens with a bottle the bottle just flows really effortlessly there's very little work involved Um, and so because of that if babies have too many bottles in the first six weeks they can develop what's called a bottle preference which is when they they just can sometimes start to refuse to breastfeed and they just they just get really upset if we try and breastfeed them and they just only settle with a bottle so when you've worked really hard to establish your breastfeeding and you're doing all these great things this would be the last thing you would want to happen because when that happens it's really up to our babies whether they come back to the breast we can't kind of force the issue so um if you know if you've established your breastfeeding over the first six weeks and then you get to six weeks and you want to introduce a bottle um totally fine then i would say you know you don't need to have a bottle before you have your baby maybe just look into it you know as you're getting closer to that six week mark um maybe you've got your breast pump already um again you might not have needed to do any expressing because um we recommend not expressing in the first six weeks if you don't have to um because we want your baby to establish your milk supply to work out this perfect balance of milk production that they need so that you're not sort of still having this oversupply and really full boobs that are you know stopping you from sleeping certain pockets through the night when your baby's sleeping for example like we really recommend expressing is kept to a minimum if not doing any but Mm. after six weeks you might be like okay I'd like to start to introduce a bottle I'd like to start doing some expressing to put milk aside so Mm. what I would suggest is always a double pump um, because a single pump um, is going to obviously take more time you're going to have to put it on both boobs Um, but also your release of your hormones happens in both breasts at the same time so Mm. if you're expressing in one boob it's going to be flowing on the other side and if you're not catching it you're mm-hmm. yeah you're in, in, affecting the whole letdown reflex so you're going to get a lot more milk if you use a double pump and you're going to spend half the time on it and our yes. time is everything with something like breastfeeding and then you're also expressing so yeah yes um hmm. so that um in summary don't worry about it when you're pregnant unless for some reason you know you're going to have to go back to work very early or be away from your baby. Otherwise, wait to see how breastfeeding goes. Wait the six weeks if you can and then you can start to pump and introduce a bottle if necessary after that. Yeah. Um, a lot of women as well have asked, like, is there a particular time of the day that is a better time to pump um, 
I know I was told that the morning is the best after that morning feed because you've got more milk, but what's your advice on that? Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, you have more milk available in the morning, so you're not going to spend as much time sitting there doing it uh, and you're going to get more milk at the time. So sort of the golden time to express is 30 to 60 minutes after a breastfeed. So you might sort of peg the, I don't know, 9 a.m. feed. Um, So at by 10 a.m. I'm going to have started on the pump and I'm just going to express what I can after, you know, over like like five minutes or so you might be just thinking I'm not going to sit here and try and take a full feeds worth because I don't want to impact like the next breastfeed Um, Mm -hmm. but I also recommend that because say for example you every day you don't have the chance to sit down and express maybe you can one day but the next day you've got to go out and so what you don't want to do is overstimulate your body to make all this extra milk because if you don't consistently express at that time then you can put yourself at risk of block ducts or mastitis so you're not going to sit there for a full feeds worth you're just going to aim to express you know I don't know 30 mils 40 mils something like that Um, and then you're going to put that aside and you will end up using milk from a few different expressing sessions to get a full feeds worth together yes I I think that's great advice because I remember being so confused by expressing because of what you just said I didn't want to up my supply at that time if I wasn't going to consistently do it and I remember being like I just someone tell me what time of the day do I need to sit down and express right now and I think that just probably sums it up think about it like bits and pieces just a small little five minutes afterwards not enough that your body then goes oh okay this is a feed time but just enough that you're getting something and then you can add it up to a proper feed later later on and do you have any specific recommendations for pump brands yeah there's lots of pumps on the market and I've worked with lots of different and I don't work for a certain brand or anything like that but I have found that the spectra pumps do better for subsequent babies Um, there's been other brands that I've worked with that I just found that they just packed it in they just their strength in the motor disappeared Um, and when they were using it like with their next baby it just didn't keep um, the suction just went so um, and because I like the Spectra brand mainly because they are all double pumps so I think they're a really clever company in that way that they're they're aware of mother's times, um, mm. mother's time. Um, so yeah, if, if, if I was going to suggest any of them, I find that they, um, they work. I'm, I'm just yet to find anyone that doesn't get good volumes from a spectra mm. pump. So that would be my recommendation. Yeah, that's great. And do you have any tips? I've, I was just thinking then that someone told me to look at a photo of my baby when I was pumping yeah. uh, to help with that letdown. Do you have any tips to help women get a good, pumping session I guess to help with that letdown to relax them completely that's a really good one to look at your baby or yeah look at if your little one's asleep look at their toys or yep if you've got a photo anything like that Um, the other thing that can really help is because the letdown reflex is very hormonally driven um, if we feel like we're a bit um, anxious or feeling a bit stressed um, or just if we're watching the bottles if we've got the pump on and we're like looking eagerly down at how much milk is coming out um, that can actually affect your letdown reflex. You can sort of stress yourself into holding all of your milk back in your milk ducts. Mm. Um, and it's that same way going back to when we um, when we orgasm. It's the same. We need to feel calm and relaxed. And we're not going to do that if we're feeling... I'm just p- <laughs> picturing someone watching their vulva like, come on, come on, come on, yeah. like it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Imagine if you were trying to orgasm and you knew someone was watching you. Like as if that's like the worst thought ever. So, you know, if, if that's, if, you know, if you're feeling observed, if you're absor- observing yourself, that's also going to affect mm. things. So it can be good. Don't look at the bottles, like look mm. somewhere else. Don't, and just, yes. yeah, just, you know, do some deep breathing, put some good music on, like just help yourself relax. Uh, mm. And that's also going to help your milk to flow freely. Yes, that's great advice. I am pumping um, at the moment. Pia is nine months and I I find I was trying to get work done while I pumped because I feel like it's not a waste of my time, but I'm very impatient. I was like, oh, come on, I've got so much to do. And it was not working for me at Mm -hmm. all. So now I have to like make a cup of tea Mm -hmm. and sit down and just look out at the ocean. That's the only way I can pump properly. And I just have to sacrifice, like I don't have a double pump. I'm really feeling like I should buy one. (laughs) But I just have to sacrifice like a good 40 minutes of my work day to do it, which is, look, at the end of the day, it's nothing. But I did find I could 
couldn't multitask. Mm. I couldn't be in like my cortical brain thinking, to-do listing. I had to just chill out. Yeah, (laughs) I get it. Well, I often get inquiries about breast pumps. So if if anyone's listening to this and is thinking, well, I need a pump, but I don't know which one I need, feel free to DM me because I can sort of work through, well, how often are you going to be expressing? Like how often are you going to be apart from your baby? Um, And I've helped many mothers, yeah, figure out the best pump for them. So Yeah. yeah, feel free to contact me, anyone. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Because I know it's, again, like with any baby product, there's so many out there. And sometimes you just need someone who's experienced to say, this is what you need. (laughs) I love it. Now, we're going to go into some practical things to finish off. So you've got your fake boob, you've got your baby. I'm not sure if you use your baby or just the fake boob, but can you show us, Amberly, two things. So the correct latch that we spoke about before so that women understand what to be looking for and hand expressing. So this is specifically when we're talking about expressing colostrum while you're still pregnant from 37 weeks onwards the technique to be able to do that properly yeah sure and which one do you want first either oh let's go whatever okay surprise me (laughs) okay I'll do the attachment first so um if you're doing baby led attachment you're going to start off with your baby in the center of your boobs make sure that their arms are up because if their arms are pinned down it's going to really impact them searching so that's sort of the main thing um and you're going to let them do the breast crawl so go through the whole process of searching for the breast and then when you're doing baby led attachment you're literally just going to put your lower arm here and put them in alignment with your boob and let them just try and go and get on on their own you're not actually going to help them if you're doing this type of technique but if you're doing the cross cradle hold or even the football hold the principles are all the same you may be needing to shape your breast a bit so what you're going to do is hold your baby using this section of your wrist behind their neck and shoulders and you're going to bring your thumb up to their ear and your fingers up to this ear So you're not holding their head, but you're not holding all the way down here that you feel like their head's kind of sliding. You you feel like you've got good control and helping them sort of guide them to the breast. And then you're going to grab your breast like a big C shape. So your fingers are underneath, and I'll use my boob for this part, um, your thumbs on top. And then basically, this is going to be a bit hard to probably demonstrate, but you're going to try and use your index finger um, and your other fingers to tilt your nipple up to the ceiling so that you can kind of roll your boob into their mouth. You roll in a downwards motion. Can you see me doing that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So you're basically... So are you just on sort of the top of the areola? Is that where you're aiming to be or a little bit higher? It depends on the size of your areola because everyone's really different. So you might feel that you've got good control if your fingers are are closer to the outer aspect of the areola or you might Mm -hmm. feel like you need to take your hand further back. That's probably Mm -hmm. something you just need to practice depending on your breast tissue and how the shape of your boobs are. Um, But yeah, generally you don't want to be close to the nipple that's really yes. important because we want all of that section in our baby's mouth so keep your yes. hands back um, and so when you're doing the tilting action we're basically waiting for our baby to do a big wide open mouth and then we're going to line up the baby's bottom lip with the bottom part of the areola so when they do that wide open mouth they're sort of in this position and the nipple and the nose are in alignment as well and then you basically roll the breast into their mouth when they're doing mm-hmm. that. Uh, it's all about the timing. Everything's about yes. the timing. So you might have to be quite swift with the rolling action um, because mm-hmm. there might be times that you go to do it and your babies quickly close their mouth and you're like, oh, I've missed the missed the window. Yes. So then you, yes. you might have to detach them with a clean finger into the corner of their mouth um, and then try again. Go back to and, – and it might yes. take several attempts, but that's basically how you would – help them if you're doing something like the cross cradle hold which is a an assisted attachment as opposed to that baby led attachment where they just do the whole thing themselves that was the best advice I ever got was detach them and try again yeah because I think I had it in my head that oh once they're on just just go yeah you know whatever let's not do it again yeah oh Mm. and that's where I think I got the nipple damage Mm. from whereas I with Pia would take her off start again take her off start again I was like we're not doing this until we're on properly and I think that made the world of difference I had no nipple damage that time around so I think that's really great advice and was that just the pinky finger to reduce that suction hole any finger that you feel more comfortable with so I usually find the index finger you'll have better control over but your pinky might feel smaller so yes that's really up to you what works best 
Yes, no, that's – and definitely don't pull them off if they are still sucking. No, don't do that. <laughs> you need to reduce that suction. That will really hurt. Do not do that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. That's a great advice. So nipple and nose or nose to the nipple yeah. and then the bottom of the areola yeah. or the area that you've clasped to the lip. Correct. Great. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. That's great. Sure. Again, this is just the things that women will go <laughs> – Ah, that's exactly that, what I needed to know. Oh, good. Well, I've got that all on my video series, which is probably makes a lot more sense when you actually see a baby doing it. And the yes. video has been slowed down. So I sort of talk through each of the stages because I think yes. visually, because we just don't see other women breastfeed. So, no. and, and where everyone's different, but I think the majority of people are visual learners. And so when yes. you can actually see, oh, that's how the mechanics work. Um, yes. It makes you so much more comfortable when it's your time. And you're like, no, no, I've seen all this. None of this is new to me because I've learned it mm-hmm. all. And it's just mm-hmm. going to really help you with, yeah, really solidifying that knowledge. Yes, I 100% agree. And we will link up your video series and all of those in details um, with this video. And it reminds me, I was just thinking last night we were at dinner and there were these um, six-year-old twins and I was feeding and they were like right up in <laughs> yeah. my boob looking at what's happening. I was thinking yeah. it's because we tell people yeah. that that's not appropriate yeah. anymore, which to be honest, it is often inappropriate depending on the relationship you have with that person, but we never get to see that because we're not. Yeah. We're, we're covering up in scarves and yeah. covers and we're never we're never seeing that. So you do have to learn these things yeah. again um, yeah. and that was perfect. So thank you so much for that. Now let's do hand expressing mm. for those women who want to do the antenatal expressing. How do we do this? Yeah, great question. So again, figuring out your boobs. Most mothers would, you would put your index finger and your thumb on the outer aspect of the areola um, and it's just about sort of having a practice and figuring out does that feel like that's where because your milk ducts remember are sort of traveling down here so there's a connection point where it then comes out the areola so you might find that you have to take your hands a bit further back to get it to flow or you might take them a little bit closer to the nipple even but basically you're going to start off by finding a section where you put your boob you'll put your hands and you're going to push back into your boob so sort of imagine I'm pushing back into the breast push Mm -hmm. back and then forward and when you come forward you sort of squeeze together squeeze your fingers Mm -hmm. together if that makes sense so Mm -hmm. back and then forward and together so it's a bit of a skill you'll be like at the start Mm -hmm. you might be like well these are a lot of things to remember but basically you just keep going in that direction and wait for it to start to bead on the end of the nipple and then have your syringe I haven't got one but let's use this no I haven't got one Um, question where do you buy syringes from yeah so you can get them online Um, you can get them in pharmacies but I find that it's really hard to find the right size and I recommend a one three or a five mil syringe probably a one if you're just starting Mm -hmm. out because you don't want to feel like you need to fill this massive syringe um Mm. and so yeah basically you would just um have it ready to collect so you're going to pull the plunger back um and the bottom section and just suck the colostrum up in the syringe yeah yeah yeah. great so once you're in uh, one spot you're going to keep your hands there so what you don't want to do is do one thing and then move your hand one thing and move your hand like that won't help you need to sort of trigger the milk ducts and sort of get in a bit of a passion with it and really stimulate them to flow and then start to collect yeah amazing and how long um would you recommend that someone try that for time like five minutes yeah I think so like you don't want to make yourself sore or make your hand sore so you know I think five to ten minutes is just a perfect amount to have a practice for and you can do it one to three times a day from 37 weeks onwards as long as yeah you've had medical clearance and you're you're good to go yeah fantastic (gasps) You are such a wealth of knowledge. Thank you so much. I know the women are going to get so much out of this. And I just hope that even if it just helps one person go from feeling extremely nervous and scared Mm -hmm. about breastfeeding to now feeling confident and empowered and I got this, you know, like I've got this. And then she tells a friend and a sister and I just think it's this collective Mm -hmm. energy of empowerment and knowledge again. I just think we've got so much access to knowledge. That's why I want to get 
get this information out to women because it is so important. Yeah. And if you want to breastfeed and you're motivated to have a successful breastfeeding relationship, then I do think knowledge is power. Same yeah. with birth. I don't think we can wing these things all the time. Yeah. I think we need to have the knowledge under our belt. And you are the perfect person to do it. You're thank so you. wonderful. So Aww. thank you so much for um, giving up your time My to yeah, spread thank the message. Thank you for having me. I think you're, you have a beautiful <laughs> community and I've, I've received such lovely feedback from so many of them about how, how they learned and, you know, great things. And I'm like, oh, that's the best. So, yeah, thank yeah. you for including me, honestly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it's been wonderful. You're, you're the best. Thank you so much, Amberly. Yes, my pleasure. Have a good day, won't you? Now, I'm sure there were some myths in today's episode that you have most definitely heard about before. And I hope now that if you hear someone talking about this, that you have the confidence to help debunk that before another poor pregnant mama is left feeling utterly confused about what is true and what isn't. I had never even heard of some of these myths before and they sounded absolutely ludicrous to me, but Amberly was well accustomed to these stories. So I dare say that these myths have been circulating for a very long time. So thankfully, ladies, you can leave the nail files alone and let your poor nipples just relax rather than tearing them up in preparation. I really hope you have enjoyed this breastfeeding series with Amberly Harris. It has been such a pleasure to deliver this to you and I cannot wait for you to dive in deep to the other guest expert series that we have coming up. 